Thank you so much. Hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, Francesco already nicely introduced me, but I'm just going to say a few more words about myself just to give a bit of context. Uh, so yeah, after uni, I started uh, working as a machine learning researcher at Bitdefender, which is a Romanian company, working mainly on computer vision using graphs. And currently, I'm a PhD student working on hypergraph neural networks at the University of Cambridge. And today, I'm going to talk about a topic that lays at the intersection between uh, my present and my past uh, interests. Namely, I'm going to speak about graph neural networks. And honestly, since five, six years ago, when I started working with graphs, I saw a huge increase in interest towards graph neural network and graph machine learning using graphs in general. And just to give you a bit of evidence, uh, both in 2022 and 2023, graph neural network was in top five most used word in the iClear papers. So iClear, for those who doesn't know, is one of the top machine learning conferences. And the interest comes both from industry and from academia, because there are like lots of papers making the cover of important journals such as Nature and Cell, all of them involving graph neural networks. But what do people, why do people care that much about graphs? I'm sure that in the summer school and probably before as well, you heard about lots of architectures. Like when you have tabular data, it's, we usually use multilayer perceptron. When you have sequential data such as text or audio data, uh, using recurrent neural network or later on transformer is quite popular. For images, for videos, we have convolutional neural network. But for many years, we didn't have anything to process graphs with. And do we really care about processing graphs? The obvious answer is yes, because that's why I'm here. Uh, but what are some useful applications of graphs? Graphs are honestly everywhere around us. Like if we think about social networks like Facebook or Twitter or TikTok, I don't know what's on trend these days. Uh, if you are thinking about users as nodes and edges as friendship, you can model the social network as graph. And in fact, Twitter uses graphs to model fake news detection. Also, roadmaps can be modeled as graph because you can think about junctions as nodes and you can think about the road, the actually street as being edges. And Google Maps uses graph neural network to estimate the time between two locations. Also, meshes can be seen as graphs, and they are very used in uh, virtual reality. Um, in recommended systems, you can think about users and products as nodes, and then form a bipartite graph and recommend other products to users. And companies such as Pinterest or Uber uses that in practice. And obviously, graphs are very, very useful in medicine, because molecules are graph in the end. So we can do drug discovery using graph, you can think about like possible side effects of cocktail drugs using graphs, modeling pandemic, which is a two hot topics <laughs> in the last few years, was done using graph neural network. So we have graphs everywhere. We need to be able to process them. And because the applications are so broad, I'm not going to be able to cover everything about graphs today. But I'm going to try to offer you like a bit of background knowledge and a bit of like basic knowledge about graph neural networks, such that if you are interested in a particular topic, to be able like to understand what's happening there and go deeper into that domain. So I'm going to try to speak about uh, how to represent a graph in memory, how to process it. We'll talk about some popular neural networks involving graphs, how powerful are graph neural networks, what can and what can't we model with graph neural networks, what are some very specific issues the graph neural network has, and also I'll try to cover a bit of hot topic what, and what happens these days in GNN literature. So as I said, the first challenge that we have when we try to model graphs is how we store it in memory. Because it's a bit trickier than any other structure that we have. And when I'm talking about a graph, I'm thinking about a set of nodes connected by some edges. And most of the time, the nodes also have some features. So in order to store those features, we create a feature matrix by just stacking the features of the nodes into a matrix. So if I have a, a graph with n nodes, each node characterized by d features, I'm going to have an n times d matrix where row number i will store the information about node number i. And in general, I will have this matrix denoted by x in the presentation. And to uh, store the structure, we usually use adjacency matrix 
which photograph with n nodes, it will be a matrix n times n. And on uh, the connectivity between node i and node j will be stored on the row i column j. So if node i is connected with node j, I'm going to have a one on row i column j. Otherwise, I'm going to have a zero. And if the graph is undirected, so each one of the edges doesn't have an orientation, then my adjacency matrix will be symmetric because an edge between i and j means that I'm going to have an edge between j and i as well. However, if my graph has also orientation, so if the edges uh, are oriented, then the adjacency matrix uh, might be uh, non-symmetric. And there's also a, a special type of edge. They are called self-loops. And the self-loops are just some edges that connect the nodes with itself. And the self-loops are stored in the adjacency matrix on the diagonal. Like if I have a self-loop for node number nine, I'm going to have a one, ve uh, one value on uh, row nine, column nine. I hope it's clear so far. And in general, I'm denoting that matrix with A from adjacency. Good, so we know how to store the uh, graph in memory. I have the feature matrix and I have the adjacency matrix. What can we do with it and how can we do that? And luckily, GNNs are quite versatile structures, so we can do lots of things with them. Uh, three popular tasks are node level classification, uh, edge level classification and graph level classification. So for node level classification, it means that I'm gonna do a prediction for each one of the nodes. Like if you're thinking about the graph as being a molecule, if I want to predict what type of, uh, a, what, what is the type of each atom, then that will be a node level prediction because I need to predict something from each one of the nodes. However, if I want to predict something at the edge level, for example, if it's a single bond or a double bond in a molecule, then I'll need to have this edge level prediction task. And also if I want a single prediction for the whole graph, so if I want to predict the solubility, for example, of the or the how toxic the molecule is, then I'll have a graph level prediction. And we will see how we tackle each one of these in the following. But the most important part is how do we actually process it? And we can do construct lots of functions that take into account the feature matrix and the adjacency matrix. But a useful function should fulfill some properties. And maybe the most important but obvious one is it needs to take into account the structure, because in the end, this is what the graph it is about. And the assumption that we are doing most of the time is I want the representation of the nodes to take more into account the representation of the neighbors and less into account the representation of the nodes that are far away. So this is how we encode basically connectivity. If it's close by, it needs to influence the representation. If it's far away, maybe it's not important. So we will try to take that into account less. And the second property, if you remember, when we stored the graph, we had the feature matrix and we have the adjacency matrix. And for that, we need an order of the nodes. Like we set a random order and then we stack them into the feature matrix in that order and build the adjacency matrix based on that order. But the order should not matter because we don't have a canonical order in the graphs. We just pick a random order because we needed it, but whatever reordering of the nodes I'm doing, the graph doesn't change it. So I don't want my processing of the graph to take into account the order because I picked it randomly. And what does that mean? If my task is graph level prediction, so a single prediction for the whole graph, I want for two different reordering of the graph, the output to stay the same. So here, for example, if that is node number two, so the features will be on row number two and the connectivity uh, will be on row number two and column number two, I will have an output. If the node is on the other hand, number seven, then the output will stay the same because I just permuted the nodes, but I didn't change the structure. And in mathematics, this is called permutation invariance. So the way I'm permuting the nodes should not influence my output. On the other hand, if I'm gonna have a prediction at the node level, then I'll, be, I'll need the way I'm permuting the input to be the way I'm permuting the output. Because if initially I have that as node number uh, two, then I will look for the output at the row number two in the output matrix. But if I reorder the graph, because in my random choice of nodes, this is now uh, node number seven, then uh, in the output matrix, I will need to look at row number seven or eight, whatever that is. And this is called permutation equivariance. So if I'm having a prediction at the node level, the way I'm permuting the input should be the way I'm permuting the output. And those are the properties that my function will need to fulfill. 
need to take into account the connectivity and not take into account the order of the nodes. And an easy way to achieve this is via message passing framework, which you'll see it's a very simple framework and it is the backbone for most of the architecture that we're having these days. And it only contains three steps. I'm having a send operation, an aggregate operation, and an update operation. And in the send operation, what I'm gonna do is for each pair of two nodes that are connected by an edge, I'm gonna compute a message as a function that takes into account the representation of the two nodes. So I have this connection here. I'm gonna have a message that takes into account the representation of the node three and the representation of the node six and combine them into a new representation. I'm having an edge between three and one. I will have another uh, function that takes into account the representation of node number three and node number one and obtain a representation for the message between the two of them. And I'll do this for each pair of two nodes that are connected by an edge. And depending on how I implement the message function, the message from four to two might be different than the message from two to four. But how do we actually implement this message function? It can honestly be any learnable function. Like the easiest way to think about it is just concatenating the representation of the two nodes and projecting it into a new representation. But the most important thing is that we need to share the parameters between uh, the function applied on each one of the edges. Like they will have different output because they will have different input, but the parameters that we are using in the message function should be the same uh, for each one of the edges when you apply it. And this will allow us A, to be permutation invariant or equivariant, and B, to be able to apply the model on two different graphs with two different number of edges. Does it make sense? Good. So this was the uh, message operator. Each pair of two connecting nodes create a representation. Then we have the aggregate operation that for each one of the nodes takes all the messages received by that node from the neighbors and combine them into a single representation. So node number three has three neighbors. So I'm gonna have three messages and I will aggregate them into a single representation. Node number seven have a single neighbor, so a single message, and I'll need to combine this message into a single representation. And I'm gonna do this for all of the nodes. So I'm taking the messages received in the previous step and aggregate them for each one of the nodes. And again, what this aggregator function uh, can be, the important thing is that it should be able to receive a variable number of arguments because different nodes might have different number of neighbors. So I should be able to aggregate different number of neighbors. And also it should be permutation invariant because the neighbors most of the time doesn't have an ordering. I don't know who is the first neighbor, who is the second neighbor. So my aggregator function should not keep an order of them. And Simple implementation of these are summation, average, maximum, any pooling basically that we can apply. It's a valid aggregator fun function. And the last step is the update operation, which we have this aggregated message that takes into account the neighbors. And I have the original uh, information stored in the graph, in the node, and I'm just gonna combine them. Basically, I combine the information about the neighbors into the rep uh, representation of the node. And I'll do that for every single node. Again, what does update function is? Any learnable function. Easiest way, concatenate the aggregated message with the original features of the node and project them into something else. And same as before, the update function should share the parameters because I want to be able to apply uh, the message passing framework to graph that have different number of nodes. Uh, questions so far? Good. So this is the entire message passing framework. Take compute a message between each pair of two nodes that are connected as a function that takes into account the representation of the two nodes, aggregate the messages for each one of the nodes from its neighborhood, and then integrate this aggregated message into the original representation of the node. And depending how I actually instantiate this uh, update, aggregate, and the um, message function, I might discover different architecture. And three of the popular one uh, used in the literature is graph convolutional network, graph attention network, and message passing neural network. And I'm gonna tell you uh, how to uh, achieve each one of them based on like the recipe that uh, we already have from the message passing framework. So graph convolutional network in the message function, which again is that function that takes into account the representation of two nodes and create a message. 
for the convolutional network, that is just a projection of the source node. So I have the two nodes, the one that send the message and the one that received the message. I'm just gonna project the representation of the sender. The aggregate is mean or sum, and the update just take the representation of the current node and combine it into the aggregated message. And we can write this shortly, like mathematically. I take the represent for the rep to update the representation of each node. I'm taking the representation uh, and project it, and I combine that with the uh, sum of the representation of the neighbors. And the very nice things about graph convolutional network is that we can very easily write it in a matrix form. So doing that update function, it's exactly equivalent to doing adjacency matrix times feature matrix times the parameter W. So you can easily implement this by just doing two matrix multiplication, basically. Why that is the case, I'm just gonna quickly explain to you, like when I'm taking the feature matrix and project it with W, what I'm doing is just independently project the representation of each one of the nodes. On the other hand, when I'm multiplying to the left side with adjacency matrix, what I'm doing is exactly summing the neighbors. Like I have that simple graph over there. And if I'm looking, oops, does this work? No, uh, sorry. I'm taking the, sorry? Yeah, but, ooh. yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, like if I'm looking at the neighbors of the second uh, node, I, it has two neighbors, one and three. So on the adjacency matrix on the second row, I'm gonna have two values of one. When I'm multiplying that row with the feature matrix, what I'm gonna obtain will be exactly X1 plus X3. So what multiplying with the adjacency matrix does is just summing the neighbors, which is exactly what we want in the uh, graph convolutional network. So putting those two observations together, if I'm doing A times X times W, what I'm doing is projecting independently each one of the nodes with the matrix W and then summing the neighbors. And because the convolutional GNN uh, takes into account uh, also the representation of the current node, what I need to do is also add X W to take into account the uh, current node as well. So what I'm obtaining is just A plus I X W and I'm implemented already my GCN. Sorry, I'm using interchangeable GCN and graph convolutional network is the same thing. And this is a layer of graph convolutional network. If I want to have multiple layers, because this is what we usually do in deep learning, I continue to multiply with adjacency matrix to the left and with uh, parameters to the right. And this is uh, in this way, I'm obtaining multiple layers of GCN. Good. So we have graph convolutional network already. A simple step forward is adding attention. And this will lead to graph attention network, which is very similar to the graph convolutional network. It's just that instead of summing the neighbors, I'm gonna weighted sum them. So in the graph convolutional network, I have the sum of the neighbors. Here, I'm gonna have the sum of the neighbors weighted by that alpha coefficient. The alpha coefficient is just a scalar. And you can think about it as if it is close to one, it means that that edge is important. If it goes closer to zero, it means that that edge is probably not important. And that will be a parameter that we're gonna learn. So it's gonna be a function that takes into, into account the representation of the two nodes and I'll put a scalar saying, is this edge important or is this edge non-important? And how do we predict that alpha? Depending on from one paper to another, we have different implementation of that. The original one takes the representation of the two nodes and just project it into a scalar. We can also do dot product in the way transformer does, and there are other variations of that. But the important thing is you take the representation and project them into a scalar somehow. And what I like about graph attention network is that it allows you a bit to modify the graph structure. Like graph convolutional network always sum all the neighbors no matter what. But graph attention network allows you if some of the neighbors are not important for your task, or if the original structure of the graph is not the perfect one, you can modify it a little bit with this attention mechanism. Because like if one of the edges is there, but I don't care about it, it's actually either noise or maybe the task that I'm, you, I want to predict is not that dependent on the structure. I can learn an alpha coefficient that is zero, and then I'm gonna drop basically that edge and do the GNN on top of another structure implicitly. Does it make sense? So those were GCN and GOT, both of them 
uh, sum the representation of the neighboring nodes, one with attention, one just a simple sum. The third flavor of graph neural network is the message passing GNN. And if you remember, originally I said that the message should take into account the source and the destination, but both GCN and GOT doesn't do that. They only take into account the source and project it. And message passing GNN, it's doing exactly this, like improving on that by having a function that takes into account the source and the destination this time. Otherwise it stays the same. Okay, so uh, those are three popular architecture. Probably if you're reading like an application paper on GNN, one of them will be used. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. Hi, thank you. So um, I'm, quite new to rough neural networks, but the attention mechanism also, um, the fact that you can apply some sort of mask to the edges, reminds me of the problem of link prediction. So um, can this be model as introducing a new node, considering all the edges from all the nodes to the novel node and thus masking depending on the relevance? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question yeah, so, with closer to the mic or something? I didn't fully understand. Yeah, so I'm trying to understand also, uh, how's the model, uh, how's the problem of, Link prediction connected to this, so could it be possible, like, to add a novel node to the to the graph, and considering that it can have a potential edge to every other node in the network, and then uh, weighting these uh, these edges depending on the relevance. So, uh, how, how is uh, attention imply in this case? Yeah, uh, that is quite related. Like when you are talking about edge prediction, there are two kind of types of work. Is the one that actually try to predict uh, the structure, and this is most of the time done in a supervised way. You model the problem as an edge predictor one and predict zero of one if the edge exists or not. And it's also the problem when you know that implicitly you will need to model the structure and then uh, like learn basically the graph structure and then predict something after, which is probably the case that you are talking about. And indeed graph attention networks allows you to do that in the same way as transformer allows you to do that. Basically, you can apply graph attention network even on a fully connected graph. Let's say that we just have a point cloud and we want to model with GNN because we think that relations are important. Then I can start with a fully connected graph and hopefully let the attention to learn the uh, real structure and actually visualize that structure that was learned. While with the GCN, if you apply GCN, the graph convolutional network on top of a fully connected graph, then what you're going to obtain will be always an average because you will always sum all the neighbors no matter what. So yeah, graph attention network can be used like to clean a little bit of structure, even from a fully connected one, and you can actually visualize it. You don't have the guarantee that you're going to learn the structure because you don't have supervision, but you can hope that if the signal is good enough, and of course, if the data is good enough, so this is machine learning, uh, then you will probably obtain good results with that. Can I follow up with a sub? Smaller question. Sure. So um, I've seen previously the GCNC matrix, but uh, it makes me think of the problem of sparsity. Also, yeah. in case it doesn't scale with, uh, with large networks. So um, I read about note to vec. I mean, I thought about word to vec first in language, which is similar to the term for many matrices and trying to actually encode co occurrences in words by using a network and predicting the links. So um, can this be transferred to, to, to graphs to find an alternative representation of edges? Yes, I haven't seen anything like that in practice, but I think that, yeah, yeah, in theory, they should be able to to accommodate that as well. And yeah, I agree, like with the nodes, the number of edges can go quite widely, so you need to take into account the sparsity somehow. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, there is one over there. Uh, I. Uh, I have a very basic question, perhaps. Uh, maybe I missed that, but could you please explain the intuition why GCNN is called convolutional? What is the role of convolutional operation? What does it have in, in common with CNNs, for example, as opposed to fit forward? Yeah, I didn't want to go into lots of details about that, not like to deviate for the understanding, but like there are two ways, there are multiple ways, honestly, to arrive at the current uh, form of GNN. One would be like, if you think about what uh, convolutional neural networks does, it just takes that kernel and basically weighted average the patch that you have in the image 
you can think if you think about the neighborhood as being your local patch that you apply the convolution on then uh, you can think about this doing exactly the same things it takes a patch of the graph and apply the filter on top of it and there's also like a spectral intuition like in the same way as Fourier transform are developed for a convolutional neural network and the convolutional network basically comes from that intuition there's a spectral way of looking at graph convolutional network as well and the Fourier transform basically will lead to exactly the equation, I mean, an approximation of the Fourier transform on graph is to exactly the uh, intuition from graph convolutional network. So that's why the name sounds wrong, but <laughs> I didn't want to go into much details. Perfect, this helps, thank you. Very welcome. Uh, there's a question there. So I'm not quite sure with the difference between the convolutional networks and uh, attention ones, because if, if you have a conv convolutional neural network, you also have like different filters with different weights. Doesn't it uh, account for the different uh, attention in, in different nodes or edge, edges? Like what's, what's the difference in the attentional approach? Because you said we have different attention for different edges, but I can uh, get this with uh, getting different filters or can, can't I? Oh, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> like, what's the difference between having an attention for every uh, node or edge and having different weight in the convolutional neural network? Uh, so in the convolutional neural network, uh, if you are looking here at what W does, it will just independently project the features of each node. So if I have the features for each one of the nodes, basically I'm having I'm projecting those D features independently into a different space, but I'm not gonna like combine the features from neighborhood or anything else with W. W just moves the feature into a different space independently for each one of the nodes. While in the attention mechanism, what the alpha coefficient does is by just telling you what neighbors to aggregate. So W works at the feature dimension, while alpha works at the neighborhood dimension. Does it make sense? Uh, any other questions? One in the back. Uh, there's someone over there. So uh, you mentioned some uh, the ability to have uh, self loops. So does this recurrence uh, have the same problems as in RNNs, uh, like exploding gradients or vanishing gradients or? in a practical setting do you can you actually include self loops yes like you can think about self loops as either a modification of the structure or you can think of self loops as adding information from the past and in that case if you think about self loop as just adding the original uh, information from the graph then it's kind of like a residual connection and then yeah it can help with exploding gradients with vanishing gradients and all of those stuff mostly with vanishing to be fair uh but yeah so the short answer is yes <laughs> thank you okay uh i'll move forward and we can take a question later on good so we discussed like about how to actually model the graph but the entire message passing framework obtain features at the node level and i said in the beginning that we can solve all sorts of tasks with GNNs, like from node level, edge level, and graph level prediction. So how do we actually move from the message passing framework to whatever we want to predict? And for node level prediction, it's quite easy because we already have new features due to the message passing framework. So all I need to do is just predict it into my output space and I'm gonna have my prediction. For the edge level, however, we have the representation of the two nodes. And what, but what we need is a prediction at the edge level. So what we are going to do is just connect the representation of the two and project it into our pre output prediction, which will be this time at the edge level. And for the graph level, again, I have a representation for each one of the nodes, but I want a single representation for the entire graph. The easiest way that I can obtain that is by just summing the representation of all the nodes and consider the sum as a good representation for the entire graph. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Uh, good. So what I mentioned is like the message passing framework as being that succession of uh, send operation, aggregate operation, and update operation. And But that is just one layer of GNN. 
If I want to have multiple layer of GNN, I can continue to do the same thing. So I have new representation for the nodes. I'll do again, send aggregate uh, update, obtain a new representation, send aggregate operate, uh, update, obtain a new representation. And each one of those uh, three operations will form a layer. And the nice things about having multiple layer in a GNN is that it allows you to look at a broader neighborhood. So a single GNN layer will only look at the neighbors because this is what our aggregate function is doing. If I want to have access to the two hub neighborhood, so the neighbor of the neighbors, then I will have to have two GNNs such that I explored a little bit more. If I want to look three hops away, I'll have three, GNN, three layer of GNN and so on and so forth. So if I have the intuition that my task requires to have access to the node that is k-hop from me, I'll need at least k layers of GNN in order not to lose this information. Good. So, so far we know how to represent the GNN in the memory and we know how to process the GNN. But what can and what can't we do with GNNs? And to understand a bit of how, what is the expressive power of GNN, we first need to understand what graph isomorphism problem is. And I'll start with a quick question. Are those two graphs different or not? Are they? Yeah, no. Yeah, it's exactly the same graph. It's just that I modify a little bit how I represented the one on the right. And this is exactly the graph isomorphism problem. So in the graph isomorphism test, you receive two graphs and you need to say if they are the same graph or they are different graphs up to the permutation of the nodes. And this is a quite popular problem in computer science and in mathematics. The left one again is the same graph. So we say that they are isomorphic. The right one, uh, no matter how I permute the nodes, I'm not gonna uh, be able to go from the graph on the left to the graph on the right. So we are saying that they are non-isomorphic. And it's quite a simple way to do as a human being, but it's a very difficult problem from an algorithmic point of view. And in fact, there are no algorithms that run in polynomial time to solve the isomorphism problem of the graphs. But we have an algorithm called weisfeiler lehmann or WL, and it's, it runs in polynomial time, so it's quite fast. However, it's not perfect. It's good enough, but it's not perfect which means that if WL tells us that two graphs are different, they are in fact different. If WL tells us that those two are similar graphs, then there's a small probability that the algorithm is wrong and the graphs are different even if WL says that they are the same. And how does this WL algorithm works? So we start with a graph and we color the nodes of uh, all the nodes in the graph with the same color. And then we are looking at the color of each node and the color of its neighbors. So I'm gonna have that uh, middle, I don't know if I can. No. Uh, the node in the middle, the one with four neighbors, it's blue and it has four blue neighbors. The bottom node is blue and it has two blue neighbors. So I'm gonna look at all of these different combinations and I'm gonna recolor each different combination with a unique color. So I have three different combination of the color of the node and the color of its neighbors. I'll have three different colors associated with them. And then I'm gonna recolor the graph based on this. So the new, I have the new graphs with new colors and I'll do the same things. I'm looking at the color of each node, the color of its neighbors and look at all different combination of this. And again, I'm gonna associate a unique color to each one of the different combinations and recolor the graph based on that. And I'll do this until from one step to another, I'm not modifying the color of the graphs anymore. This is the moment when you are saying that it converge and it's proved mathematically that it actually, the algorithm will converge no matter what. And the set, the multi-set of colors that I'm obtaining at the last iteration will be my representation of the graph. And now in the uh, graph isomorphism test, I'm gonna have two graphs. I'm gonna apply this algorithm to both of them. I'm gonna obtain two multi-sets of colors and if those multisets are equal, then I'm gonna say the, the graphs are isomorphic, otherwise they are different. Does it make sense? Good. And why do we care about WL test in the GNN uh, presentation? Because there is a nice result presented in the paper, How Powerful Our Graph Neural Network, saying that any GNN that is based on the message passing framework 
is at most as powerful as WL. So we know that WL is not perfect. We know there are pairs of graph that we are not able to distinguish between, but we know that our GNN based on message passing framework will not be able to solve those. It's at most as powerful as WL. But a more positive result is that under some conditions, so if the aggregate update and readout, readout is a function that creates the final representation, like the graph level representation, edge level representation, whatever. If those three functions are injective, then the graph neural network based on message passing neural network is exactly as powerful as WL. So whatever WL can uh, distinguish, MPNN will distinguish as well. Make sense? Uh, there's a question over there. Sorry, what is one WL? So the WL that I talked about so far is one WL. I'm going to talk uh, in the following about higher order ones, but whatever I presented so far, it's one WL. Okay. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Good. So I said that like under some nice condition, aggregate update and readout being injective, but how such injective function looks like. And I'm just going to give a, a simple example of them. For the aggregate and readout function, because there are functions that receive a set and create a representation out of it, the injecting function can be sum. So average or me, uh, average or max is not injective in that sense. Applying sum as an aggregator, it's an injective multiset function. And for the update, the update was that function again that received the aggregated message and the current representation of the node and try to combine them. If I'm doing in the same way as I did in the graph convolutional network, so take the summation of the neighbors and combine with the representation of the current node, but with the representation of the current node weighted by one plus epsilon with epsilon a learnable parameter, that is an, update, an injective function. So just f of c plus sum of f of x would not be injective, but if I'm just modifying that by weighting the current representation of the node with one plus epsilon, where epsilon is a learnable uh, scalar, then I'm going to obtain an injective function. So putting all of this together, we end up with graph isomorphism network or GIN, which is an architecture that is as powerful as WL. So GCN is not as powerful as WL, but this is the most basically powerful from a WL perspective architecture that we can build. It just takes summation as an aggregator and combine it with the representation of the current node weighted by one plus epsilon. Good. Uh, questions so far? I don't think so. Good. Uh, so I said in the beginning that WL, it's nice, it's polynomial time, it's simple, but it's not perfect. And in fact, there are those kind of very easy cases that WL fails. So WL is not able to distinguish between the graph on the left and the graph on the right. It will always associate the same set of colors to both of them. And obviously for us, those are quite easy task, like one is two cycle, one is one cycle, it's easy to spot. And because WL fails to distinguish between them, GNN will fail as well, because we said that GNN is as much as powerful as WL. And again, a simple example, two triangle versus a, a six node cycle, a GNN and WL are not able to distinguish between them. And because of that, and because the first graph has two triangles, the second one obviously doesn't have any triangles, we can say that GNN is not able not even to count triangles in a graph because it will associate the same representation to both of them, but they have different labels, basically. And just to give you a very short intuition on why WL fails these simple cases, when we are doing WL on a graph, you saw that we always like in one iteration, we are looking at the neighbors, in two iteration, we are looking at the neighbors of the neighbors and so on and so forth. So if we start on the on one of the triangles from the top node, in one iteration, we will see the uh, right node, this node over here. In two iteration, we will see this one. And in three iteration, we will see again this node here. While on the bottom one, if I'm starting from here, in one iteration, I'm here. In two iterations, I'm here. In three iterations, I'm here. But this node and the node that I started with are indistinguishable from the structure perspective. They don't have features. And they all both have two, uh, two neighbors. So from a WL perspective, they look the same. 
And this is why WL fails to do this. WL is not able to understand if it's so or not again. So I close the cycle or I saw someone far away from me, but it looks exactly the same as me. And because I don't have this like idea of identity of each node, WL fails to distinguish easy cycles. It just doesn't know when I come back from where I started. And like we saw already, it's an easy case that we would like to be able to solve and we are not able with GNNs. So researchers started to think like, okay, how can I improve the simple GNN such that I obtain something more powerful and potentially be able at least to count triangles. And there are some directions of study for that. The simplest one is by just augmented features. So I said that the problem is that each node doesn't have an identity. I'm not able to understand it that I close the cycle. So an easy way would be add some features such that they get, became distinguishable. And there are many types of features that I can add. The simple one is just assign an order of the nodes and encode each one of these, like let's say that that is uh, node number three. I'm gonna one hot encode uh, the number three and attach that as a feature to my node. And that's an easy way. The network will be able to understand that it came back where it started because each one of the nodes has different features in the second part of the feature vector. And But the problem is that I said in the beginning that it's important to be permutation invariant and that the order of the nodes doesn't matter. And now I'm actually imposing in the uh, network to use as features my order, which is not unique. But sometimes in practice, it actually works pretty well. Like if the network managed to understand that this is just my way of understanding the identity of each node, then I'm fine. Another way of uh, encoding some kind of information in additional features is by just using random feature. Okay, I don't like to use identifier because I don't have an order. Just assign some random features, three features, four features to each one of the nodes. And because they are uh, picked randomly, probably they will be different and they can work as an identifier. The problem about this approach is that it's quite stochastic. So if I'm gonna input the same graph twice, because I assign different random features to each node, I might have different output, which is something that is quite annoying. And the third and maybe more informed way of adding feature is by using more informative from a structural perspective feature. And one such example is by using spectral pictures. So things like the eigenvector associated with the adjacency matrix or any centrality of the nodes, any graph related features that we have. I'm not gonna go much into details, but if you want, we can speak after. So the idea of the feature augmentation approach is just add some feature to be able to identify nodes. The second line of work use KW architecture because you asked about why 1W. 1WL is the easiest way of doing WL test, but there are some KWL architecture which looks a bit higher order to the graph. What does it mean is that WL just assign colors to each node and in the same way GNN just assign feature to each node and propagate information between nodes. KWL will assign colors to K tuple of nodes and propagate information between those K tuples. So for example, 2WL would assign different colors to each pair of two nodes and then propagate information between those pairs of nodes. 3WL will assign color to each pair of three nodes and propagate information between them and so on and so forth. And there's the good things about WL uh, architecture and the higher order one especially is that we have a hierarchy of this WL test. So we know that 1W and 2W are equally uh, powerful in distinguishing graphs. 3WL is strictly more powerful than 2WL. 4WL is strictly more powerful than 3WL and so on and so forth. So if we build an architecture that is as powerful as KWL, we will know that it's more powerful than the usual uh, GNN model. And I'm not going into much details about this, but the idea would be again, don't propagate in the message passing between nodes, propagate between tuples of nodes. And a big problem with that is that if you think about all the K tuple of nodes that you can form in a graph, that number grows up very quickly. And there were issues in putting them in practice. There are lots of work in trying to do it sparsely, try not to take all the K tuples, just select some of them. But overall, like they have good theoretical performance, but it's quite hard to put it in practice. And a third type of like 
trying to design MPNN that are more powerful than the uh, simple GNN network is by instead of propagating information on a graph, work with subgraphs. So I'm gonna start with the original graph. One way of doing this is just splitting the graph into multiple subgraphs, processing each one of them independently, and then aggregate the information between them. Another way of achieving this, you can take some set of a substructure that we think that are relevant for my task, task, for example, cycles and paths and bridges, and look at each one of the nodes in how many of these structures is part of, and append that as a, as an additional feature. Or and there are also other more sophisticated way of integrating substructures using simplicial complexes, cell complexes. Basically, instead of propagating the information on a graph, look at it as a more complex topological object and propagate the information of that. But again, I'm not going into details. What's important to remember is that GNN is as powerful as WL test. If you want to go more powerful than WL, you start to do tricks, either adding features, propagating as in KWL, or working with subgraph as opposed to working with the entire graph on one shot. Any questions so far? We are time-wise. I was worrying about the proof one uh, WL and two WL have the same express in the same. With a little bit of like graph knowledge, it's easy to parse. <laughs> like for uh, for the entire hierarchy, all you need to do is prove the equality and then show a graph that one of them distinguish and the other one not. The equality is not very hard to follow as as a proof. I can send a link or something if you're interested. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, there's a question over there as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> so there was a recent paper stating that in actual light, most common benchmarks, most graphs can be distinguished by just one WL. But we see that even in these cases, uh, more expressive genes usually perform better. So what might be the reason there? Maybe they learn, I don't know, more general features. What might be the intuition? Uh, so the question is, uh, because the current benchmark doesn't involve most of the time distinguish something higher than one WL test, why do they perform better in practice? Yeah. Exactly. I think it's a mixture of most of the things. For example, with a simplicial complex approach, or even with the one that counts in how many substructures each node is, just encoding information that is relevant for the task, for example, considering the cycle as one of the substructure, knowing that the cycle is important in chemistry, might add some information without even realizing that it's important information for the task. And also, like, uh, I don't know about higher order graphs to be fair because I haven't actually worked with them, but with a feature augmentation, it just makes the things uh, optimized a little bit easier because like those spectral pictures in the end, some of them can be learned by the gen in any way, but just giving them as input allows the learning to be faster because it doesn't have to learn that as well. You give that as an input and you let the gen and learn other things. So I think it's a mixture of like, sometimes injecting some information that are relevant for, for the text and sometimes just simplifying the optimization process. Okay, thanks. But yeah, the fact that we have benchmarks that most of the time are solved by WL test, it's a bit problematic because real world, I don't think that it's solved by WL test. Uh, questions? Sorry. Um, are there situations where we want to maintain the order in the graph or uh, that it's not necessary for it to be permutation invariant? Like, for example, in language, uh, if this was applied there, you would want to maintain the order or the position of the words uh, in a sentence. So um, are there situations basically where you wouldn't want it to be permutation invariant? Yeah, like... Uh... In language, for example, when you, if you are right, when you are working with transformers, we need to encode the position, and we are doing that with the sine and cosine thing. Uh, and sometimes, like yeah, the 
additional features, you can think about them as a positional encoding, similar to what's happening in language. And in fact, like when people try to apply transformer to graphs, they had they need a way to encode that position. And most of the time, the spectral features, the eigenvectors of the Laplacian are used as a positional encoding. But it's a bit of literature that try to explore smarter way of doing this, but spectral feature is most of the time the answer. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a question there as well. Uh, great talk so far, thank you. Uh, Quick question that goes back to the pro to the first part of the process. Uh, I, you may have mentioned this, so sorry if I missed it. The calculation of the adjacency matrix of the optimum graph is it? There are many different ways you can do this. I guess it's stochastic. Yes, sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, the the calculation of the adjacency matrix of the of the graph that you use. Let's say the original graph. Is it is it, you know, is it probabilistic? Is it stochastic? How do you do that? Uh, so the question is, if the adjacency matrix is not fixed, if we don't work with graph, but we work with some like points, for example, it, it's if... actually more simple. How how do you calculate the adjacency matrix if in the in the very beginning of the process? Like the adjacency matrix, if we have the graph is just a zero one matrix. Yeah. But you can also uh, add ways to this. Like instead of just having zero and one, you can have a probability there. But it's not stochastic in the way of like I'm sampling from that probability. But it's stochastic in the sense that, like, when I'm averaging, it's gonna be like a probabilistic average in that case, because it's the uh, ways will have the uh, meaning of being a probability. There are some works that try like to infer the structure or learn a better structure, and those works try to learn a probability for each one of the edge, basically for each position in a adjacency matrix, and then with Gumball softmax, just uh, try to sample an adjacency matrix. But in the typical standard way of doing GNN, uh, you don't have like stochasticity in how you uh, predict the adjacency. You have it as an input or you learn it as a set of weights, but that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there's another question there. Um, I'm having a trouble with understanding something is so we we said from the beginning that we are looking for isomorphism for graphs because it will um, it will help you to express um, no it, it's it's gonna be it's it's a good property to have because it you can distinguish between two graphs that have not the same ordering of the of the nodes and edges but have like it's it's basically the same graph then we evolve to the fact that okay if if um, a gnn is um, is going to be powerful like with all of the theorems blah 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 is like we ended up saying that the, um, a gnn will be as powerful as um, wl or kwl then my question is what is the point of having a, an architecture that uh, have the same or can capture the the isomorphism. Is it going to help me in applications? How does that? I mean, what is that going to help me express or get insights from data? Thank you so much. That's a very good question, and it was it is still a question like in the research community. The idea is that ideally we want to be able, at least in theory, to assign different representation for graphs that are different. So if you are able to sort the isomorphism problem, we know that if two graphs are different, I assign different representation. And from that, I can learn my task. I don't know. I know that there will not be cases when two graphs are different, but I, assume, I assign the same representation even if they have two different labels. Because if that is the case, if I try to solve, for example, counting the triangles, knowing that I have some failure uh, cases, I know that I'm not going to be able to solve that. But how much is that the case in practice? It's not known so far, because sometimes, yeah, you don't want to be perfect in the isomorphic test perspective. If maybe I want to predict the toxico toxicity of a molecule, or how toxic a molecule is, and then maybe what if I don't need to be able to assign different representation for different nodes, maybe it's enough to just solve the task and that's all. But WL allows us to understand like, when are we gonna do wrong? What are like the 
graphs that I know I'm gonna assign the same representation no matter what my signal is. And like, it's more like a tool that we are using theoretically to understand where are you going wrong rather than like our goal to, okay, I want to have an architecture that perfectly distinguish any pair of two graphs. Like we know to be careful because sometimes we focus too much on uh, developing architecture that solve the graph isomorphism problem perfectly, but then can solve a downstream task. But also we need to know where are you going wrong and what we can distinguish. And that's where WL helps us. Does it make sense? Yes, can, can I have a very quick follow-up question? Yes. So, so basically beforehand, if I have data and I want to uh, express that data in a, in a GNN, I don't know if I need isomorphism or not. Yeah, exactly. That's why like sometimes the simple GCN works better than GN. So GN is that architecture that I said that is as powerful as WL, but GCN, because it doesn't have those injective, injective function are less powerful than WL, but sometimes GCN obtain better results than GN just because like it's better for my task. My task doesn't know graph, doesn't need graph isomorphic test. So it's just something being easier to optimize my obtain better results. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll go forward just to, uh, do we have time? Sorry? Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some challenges that GNN has. So I know, that they can be powerful. I know that they can be more powerful than WL. However, sometimes when I'm training them, I'm not obtaining as good results as I want to. And there, some of the problems are related to how easy the network it is to generalize. Sometimes uh, it's about uh, optimization, but there are also some very graph uh, related issues. And I'm gonna talk about two of them, over smoothing and over squashing. And uh, over smoothing means, okay, I said that if I want to access neighborhood uh, that are far away from the current node, I need to do multiple GNN later, uh, layers. But if I'm doing too much GNN layers, if my network is too deep, then what I'm gonna observe is that all of my features will start to look the same. Because I'm always aggregating the neighbors, especially if the graph is dense, all the features will look the same. And this is something, especially if two nodes that are connected needs to have different label, this is problematic because I will not be able to distinguish between them. And there are some techniques to avoid that. One of them would be to add residual connection, same as uh, your colleagues asked previously. So just adding the information from previous layers will allow me to keep the nodes different and sometimes help. It's the same idea that uh, ResNet in computer vision is using. Another technique you, is that because we know that dense graphs are more prone to over smoothing than a sparser one, just drop some edges. If we think that the structure is not very, very relevant for the task, randomly drop some edges, obtain a sparser structure, and hopefully avoid over smoothing this way. And there are also like very specific architectural uh, changes. For example, we can change the bash norm or layer norm or whatever normalization we are using in normal neural networks and use pair norm, which uh, is a type of normalization especially designed to uh, avoid oversmoothing. And another challenge, so oversmoothing means that all the nodes start to look the same if I'm propagating too much. Over squashing, on the other hand, is if I'm having a graph and I want to send information between very far away nodes, uh, then I might end up my message to be lost on the way. So to send a message from the blue node to the red node, I need to go through all the paths that goes from blue to red. But as I'm going through the paths, I continue to collect more and more information from other neighbors. And it might end up that my information got lost in all that noisy information that I'm receiving from other neighbors. And this is what the worst question is about. The message is just diluted and doesn't arrive where I want it to arrive. And that is a problem, honestly, just when you need long range connection. So if you don't need to send messages between far away nodes, then you don't need to bother about over squashing. However, if your task, you think that the task requires to send messages uh, 10 hops away, then you might end up having over squashing. And people started like to analyze quite, uh, quite a lot how over squashing works and why this is appear and when is it appear. What we know so far is that there are certain types of graph where it appears more than others. For example, if we have like negative curvature, so if we have like two connected clusters, 
connected by very few edges, like this bridge here. All the messages from left to right will need to go through that edge. And there's a high chance that that edge will not be power, the message encoded in that edge will not be powerful enough to keep all the information that we need. So this kind of like negative curvature, so bridges in the graph are quite prone to over squashing. And where, when there is a problem, there are also solutions. Uh, one solution would be not to propagate just in the original graph, but also propagate from time to time on fully connected graph, such that uh, these distances are not that high all the time. Another solution would be to add additional nodes connected with everyone. And in this way, the longest path between two nodes will always be two. So at most uh, two. So uh, I'll be able to send messages quite quickly. And another uh, solution would be to rewire the graph. We know that those negative curvature edges are bad. So we can try to rewire the graph such that the curvature started to increase, basically adding nodes between clusters that are not enough connected between them and uh, try to obtain a graph that is less prone to over squashing. And yeah, I'm just gonna name a few of the application before I will take uh, questions. Uh, like there are lots of hot topics these days, both on theory and application. They are used in drug discovery, in fake news detection, as I said, chemistry, self-driving car, chip design. People are working hard in trying to integrate everything that is done theoretically into actual applications. An important and uh, quite researched topic is geometric graphs. So all I've talked about today are graphs that doesn't have positions in space, but for example, molecule, you can think about them as a geometrical shape that lives in space. So sometimes you actually want to encode some position of the nodes or relative position between the nodes and how to encode that, but still maintain uh, rotation invariance, translation invariance. It's an important topic and people are working on that. Higher order structures is something that is close to my heart because this is what my PhD topic is about. So instead of just propagating information, taking into account relations like edges that connect two nodes, try to have edges that connect three or four nodes at the same time. And we can do that with hypergraphs, implicial complex, cell complexes, all sorts of mathematical structures. And also like people try to uh, actively work on uh, overcoming over smoothing and over squashing with different types of methods. And of course, like diffusion is a hot topic these days in machine learning in general is used to generate image. We start to use that to generate graphs as well. And it has quite a good success in drug discovery. And yeah, that's all I have to say. Is there any questions? And if we have time for it.